how many of your credit card numbers have you memorized? Or how about all the bank accounts you've ever had? How many of those account numbers do you have committed to memory? I mean, is that an unreasonable question? After all, few of us can even recite the number pi beyond three digits, like 3.14 something something something, right? Well, don't feel too bad. Focus on something that you're a lot more familiar with. How about words? How many words do you think you know? 3,000? 4,000? Maybe 10,000? Well, actually, according to a sophisticated yet really fun website, testyourvocab.com, if you're like most adults in the U.S., you probably know somewhere around 20 to 30,000 words. And that's a lot to remember. I mean, for each word you have, uh, you've you got to keep track of how each one looks, how it sounds, and, and even what it means. And the question is, how could our brains remember so many words when we'd all struggle to remember a half a dozen internet passwords? The quick answer is that there's something special about human language. And anthropology, it's going to help us figure out why. Today, our mission is to explore the development and nature of human language because, like cities, farming, and tools, and even money, language has definitely played a starring role in our continued survival as a species. And surprisingly, today's mission, well, it's going to bring us right back to the primates, but we'll also get our first real glance at the third subfield of anthropology, and that's linguistics. Now, when I talk about the origins of language with my students back at Fairfield University, I usually start with a rather goofy experiment. You see, I asked for a volunteer to leave the classroom, and then I hide one of the volunteer's possessions without them knowing it, right? And last semester, for example, I hid a, a, an iPhone on top of the ceiling projector. Um, then I bring that volunteer right back in, and I explain the rules. I tell the whole class that everyone has to help this volunteer find his phone, and that we'll cancel that day's reading quiz if he finds it in less than 45 seconds. But wait, they can't use facial expressions, they can't use body language, or anything other than a gorilla hoot. You know, kind of like a hoo, 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 right? Well, they act shy for a second, but with that free quiz on the line, they get loud fast. And sure enough, they always win. Without any training, they manage to make hoots in such a way as to lead their pal right to the goods every single time. Now, anthropologists, they think these hoots are actually keys to the origins of human language. First, Let's look at contemporary primates to see how they communicate, and then we'll push some boundaries and try to actually talk with some apes. Now remember, we're not looking at contemporary primates because they're earlier, less evolved versions of us humans. To the contrary, uh, in lecture four, we learned that contemporary primates, like South American monkeys, they're not less evolved at all. They just took a different evolutionary path. Nonetheless, because we share a common ancestor, our monkey friends, well, they can help us unpack the roots of human language. So, it's time to listen to some monkey talk, or primate calls to use the more appropriate term. Deep in the rainforest of Central America, as we climb into an observation platform, we hear him. He's a sprightly tamarind monkey, and he chirps at us from over there in the next tree. Now, as primatologists interested in the origins of language, we record these monkeys, Right? We record them and their vocalizations because eventually we can start to break down their code to see how this monkey talk actually works. And for this tamarind friend over there, primatologists have already recorded and cataloged almost 40 distinct types of these vocalizations. Now, the chirp that we just heard, well, he made a greeting chirp, and that's what we call a bee chirp, right? And there's actually a half a dozen or more additional unique chirps that each mean something different. Now, there's chirps to signal nearby food, and there's another high-pitched chirp that sounds the alarm of, say, a nearby predator. These tamarins, they make other calls too, like, like whistles. And then, when they combine vocalizations like whistles and chirps, they actually convey simple sentences to their families and friends. For example, they can tell each other that there's a predator around, and they can include a second call that gives a better idea of how close or where that danger actually lurks. And you know what? This, my friends, is revolutionary. I mean, there was a time that we thought communicating in sentences was solely a human trait. But does this mean that if we raise a chimpanzee or bonobo as a human, 
if we work hard and we teach it human language, that he'll be able to talk with us about, say, the meaning of life? <laughs> well, believe it or not, we've actually tried this. Back in 1951, an actor who would later become President of the United States, uh, Ronald Reagan, he starred in a comedy movie called Bedtime for Bonzo. And in this film, he was a psychology professor who was raising a chimpanzee at home as a human. His mission? To test the nurture versus nature question. He wanted to see if a human upbringing can produce a human chimpanzee. And I know, as goofy as that sounds, the film, it really wasn't very far from the truth. Actually, it was just the Hollywood version of some true work that had been begun just a couple of years earlier with uh, a series of high-profile apes living and learning with humans. Now, I want to briefly introduce you to a handful of apes who helped us explore the boundaries of human versus other ape-to-ape -ape communication, because it's on these boundaries of primate communication that we'll find the origins of our language. First. Let's start in the 1930s, where we're going to meet Gua, a chimpanzee who lived with Luella and Winthrop Kellogg. Now, in what sounds like another pitch for a family movie, the Kelloggs brought home Gua, a 7.5-month-old chimpanzee, and they brought him home to raise him alongside their own 10-month-old son, Donald. Now, this duo, they spent 12 hours a day together, and they were fast friends. Remarkably, in the short year they lived together, Gua actually was a quicker study on basic manual tasks like, say, using a spoon. But that said, Gua simply wasn't able to make progress with learning to speak. In fact, after about a year, it was Donald who started imitating Gua's sounds. So you can imagine, shortly after that, the Kellogg's returned Gua to a primate research center. Then, in the late 1940s and 50s, psychologists Catherine and Keith Hayes, they tried a similar experiment raising a young chimpanzee as a human. Her name was Vicky, and they dressed Vicky up in white lacy dresses, she ate at the table, and they even threw birthday parties with cakes and candles. However, one of their biggest hopes as primatologist parents was to teach Vicky to speak. And despite tireless efforts on everyone's part, Vicky, she only learned to speak four words, mama, papa, cup, and up. Sadly, Vicky died of viral meningitis at the age of seven. But what we're discovering with these early studies was that there were physiological and neurological reasons Vicky couldn't learn to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I mean, let's think about this. What if non-human primates physically can't speak like us? Perhaps it's their physiology that just can't keep up, right? We've got an amazing flexibility of our human tongue and our larynx. So if we accept the idea that Vicky couldn't speak with humans, there's one more question. Does that mean she can't understand human language? That brings us to our next primate, right? Researchers Allen and Beatrix Gardner, they asked that exact question, and they changed the way we think about primates and their linguistic potential. The Gardners, they raised a chimpanzee named Washoe as a human, but not with a sibling. Washoe lived a human life with toys, clothes, playtime, and believe it or not, even chores. And to gauge Washoe's linguistic abilities, the gardeners taught her American Sign Language. And in all, amazingly, she learned some 250 words, which she later taught to her adopted chimpanzee son. Now, not only was Washoe the first non-human primate to ever learn American Sign Language, she was also the first non-human primate to teach ASL to a new generation. Now, the second chimpanzee who learned ASL was a hilarious primate named Lucy, right? Lucy lived her human life with Maurice K. Temerlin, and she was a natural. She made and served tea, she had a cat, she even drank a bit of gin, swore, and <laughs> believe it or not, she enjoyed flipping through the pages of Playgirl magazine. Um, Lucy, she learned ASL from Roger Fouts, uh, who fondly reminisces about Lucy's wicked sense of humor. One time, uh, Fouts arrived for an ASL session with Lucy, and he discovered that, well, um, Lucy had relieved herself right on the carpet. Uh, he called her in, and remember, this is with signs, he pointed at the pile on the floor. What that, he said. Lucy acted a bit coy. What that? So Fouts doubled down. You know, what that? 
Lucy said, dirty, dirty. See, that was her word for number two. Um, so Fouts continued uh, the interrogation. Who's dirty, dirty? And then Lucy flat out lies right into his face and blames Susan Savage Rumbaugh, a famous primatologist that was a graduate student at the time. Um, Fouts says, it's not Sue. Who's that? And that's where Lucy goes all in. Roger, she said. I mean, what audacity. She actually blamed Fouts himself for putting that pile on the floor, right? But Fouts, Fouts, he pushed back. No, not mine. Whose? To which she finally fesses up. Lucy, dirty, dirty. Sorry, Lucy. Lucy and Washoe, they made it clear that our primate cousins have the capacity to learn our human language. And as their language abilities emerged, their unique personalities became apparent to us. And more contemporary research has revealed that we're only scratching the surface of the linguistic boundary between humans and other apes. The famous gorilla Coco, for example, Coco's learned over a thousand ASL signs, and as a result, she's had a voice in expanding ape research in the 21st century to prioritize a conservation mission. Now, the fascinating research into primate language learning has given us spectacular views into, well, as strange as this sounds, the, the mental life of apes. And what we've discerned is that the more our ape cousins speak our language, the more their personalities and behaviors, well, the more they feel human. And wait, now wait, that said, influential linguist Noam Chomsky, he warns us not to get our hopes up about future conversations with gorillas about the meaning of life. Um, you know, his primary critique is based on the idea that our primate cousins, despite our shared genetics, they just don't have the unique linguistic legacy developed exclusively in the Homo sapiens line. Their physiology and neurology, their bodies, and their brains, they preclude chimpanzees from any advanced comprehension of human language. So what is it exactly about human language that makes it so unique? What exactly is human language? That terrific question is going to bring us square into linguistics, the third subfield of anthropology. And within that subfield itself, there are three major specializations that help us understand the origins and nature of human language. Now, first, there's historical, historical linguistics. Um, that's the evolution and the extinction of language, right? Uh, we have descriptive linguistics, where we study the mechanics of language. And last, third, sociocultural linguistics. And that's where we're going to explore the relationship between language and culture. So today, let's lead with historical linguistics. As I said a moment ago, historical linguistics investigates the evolution of language. And in a way, when we were talking with the primates earlier, technically, we were doing some historical linguistics because primatology gave us biological and even cultural insight into the development of the unique nature of human language. So like Darwinians constructing the biological family tree back to single cell organisms, historical linguists, well, they collectively build a beautiful linguistic tree that shows us how, how our languages have branched out and spread through various populations all across the globe. And well, one tool that, that helps us create our massive human language tree is glottochronology. Right? And just as we can map the spread of humankind into the Americas, we can use glottochronology to map the diversification of human languages across the planet. And on its surface, the idea is simple. Based on the idea that vocabularies tend to change at a similar rate across time and space, it becomes possible to contrast the core vocabulary of two languages to calculate their chronological separation. We're not going to get into the technicalities of these calculations, but the gist of it is this, that two languages like English and German, for example, they share linguistic origins. And therefore, they still share some core vocabulary words. And the longer they're apart, however, the more their core vocabularies will begin to differ. So linguists and others, they sometimes question the reliability of glottochronology, but more recently, with more sophisticated computational methods, complex phylogenetic reconstructions help us see how languages, like farming and tools, have spread across the planet 
with good old intrepid Homo sapiens. Now, in addition to the evolution of language, historical linguistics also researches dead and disappearing languages. And it's worth noting that of the six or 7,000 languages known today, half or more of these languages are predicted to go extinct by the end of this century, maybe even earlier. Now, around 10% of those remaining languages, for example, uh, they're spoken by fewer than 10 people total, right? And in the US, believe it or not, we have one of the one of, we're one of the nations with the highest numbers of endangered languages, right up there with Brazil, Indonesia, and India. So many Native American languages, the languages of the Caddo, the Menominee, the Pawnee, and many other Native American people, they're endangered because there's only a few speakers left who can keep them alive. Now, there are efforts, though, to improve this situation. For example, the Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. They work to preserve Native American languages like the Yuchi from dying out. Now, the Yuchi people, they traditionally lived in the Tennessee River Valley, but after suffering from the disease and conflict that Europeans brought to the Americas, they were eventually removed to Oklahoma. And as of 2011, there were only five fluent speakers of the Yuchi language left. Now, obviously, the future of any endangered language is dependent on young people learning and using it, right? So that's why language preservation programs focus on educating children and young adults. And a head-bobbing example of some of the newer ways people have been integrating youth into language revitalization is endangered language hip-hop. Like Slim Craze, a rapper from Norway. Uh, this guy, he raps in Sami, which has fewer than 20,000 speakers. Uh, and closer to home, First Nations groups in the Americas, they're also preserving their ancestral languages through rhymes and a host of other creative avenues. Now, we have a basic understanding of historical linguistics. Let's go ahead and turn to descriptive linguistics, which will focus on the conventions and mechanics that make language work. Just imagine, as if everything that made a language work, right, its basic parts, imagine they're neatly packed into a box. It's descriptive linguistics that can help us open that box to see what's in there. And when we do that, we find there are five key elements of human language. The first element is phonemes. And these are essentially base sound units, right? There's no meaning there, like <gasps> or uh, right? We in English have 44 of those. Other cultures and other languages, like say Lithuanian, they have 59. Now the second, the second unit here is morphemes. Now morphemes, they're also base units, but these are base meaning units as opposed to base sound units. Like, like the word, or not even the word, but the idea of un or non. When I say un, it's not a word, but you know what I mean. The last three are fairly simple. Uh, we've got grammar, which is the rules. Uh, we have syntax, which is sentence structure, you know, where to put the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives. And last, we have semantics, which delves deep into meaning, right? Now, with these constituent pieces, there are limitless possibilities to what we can learn about the nature and origins of language. Linguists working in the Middle East, for example, they studied a community named Al Said, which offers intriguing insights into our instinct for this thing called language. You see, El Said, it's sometimes called the village of the deaf because this Bedouin community in Israel's Negev desert, they have a large deaf population, which is the result of a local genetic mutation that leads to a higher prevalence of deafness. And the geographical and social isolation of this community, well, it explains why this village of the deaf developed a distinctly local sign language Right? The El Said Bedouin language, which is structurally distinct from the spoken languages and the regionally dominant sign languages of Hebrew and Arabic. Ultimately, the development and evolution of this unique local sign language supports the idea that we humans are born communicators. Right? With our language instinct, we're equipped to create languages, well, when we need to. Okay. So far, we've looked at historical and descriptive linguistics. So wrapping up our introduction of the three major specializations of linguistic anthropology is sociocultural linguistics. And from a bird's eye view, sociocultural linguists, they investigate the relationship between language and culture. And trust me, 
there's a lot more to that than you might think. Consider this example. In the US, you know exactly what would happen if we were all at a party and all of you saw me break that antique lamp in the corner, right? It was an accident, I assure you, but I did knock it right off that table. Um, then the host barges in and asks, what just happened? Well, with all of your fingers point, pointed right at me, you'd give me up, right? In a second, it was Scott, Scott did it, right? I'd blush, I'd feel even worse and begin apologizing, right? But wait, it didn't have to go down like that, right? You might be surprised to learn that some languages are a lot more forgiving than others. So let's move that party to Tokyo, right? In Japan, that same scenario might take a little bit of a different route. When that host asked, what just happened here? Japanese speakers, they might not be so quick to give me up. Instead of saying that I knocked the table off the table, the lamp off the table, the more conventional response might be something that expresses a greater appreciation for the concept of an accident. Maybe something like, the lamp fell off the table. Nice, right? Uh, of course, this is a generalization, and the point is that linguistic norms definitely differ across cultures, and those differences can shape the way we observe and perceive our daily lives. In Mali, my farmer friends uh, who speak Bamana Khan they use a 24-hour cycle to track each day, just like you and me, but we often use strictly Bamana Khan time categories. And these categories are different from Western modes of speech, which tend to focus on specific hours and minutes. By contrast, when my friend Bakari says he'll come visit me at Wulafe, I don't have a specific clock time in mind, but I know he'll be around sometime in the late afternoon probably on the way home from the fields just before it's time for the adults' turn to bathe, right? Now, the whole day may fit this 24-hour cycle, but the pacing of work teams, family meals, and daily life, it's still basically structured into four dynamic and unequal parts. There's waking up and starting work in the morning, and just as we switch to Tilen, or phase two, we pause for a meal and maybe a brief break, and you better get back to work, though, uh, the end of phase two, because as phase three comes around, folks return to the household for showers and tea, and the final phase then finally brings us into the nighttime when we eat and socialize with family just before turning in for bed. It's a simple, less than sensational observation, I know, but it does go to show how our language can influence our sense of time and how we run our lives. In the village, we don't need daylight savings time because soufe or nighttime, it never changes, right? Night is night. And due to the season, sometimes it breaks closer to what the watch people might call 6 p.m. and uh, maybe at other times closer to 7 or 8. But this leads to a longer workday over the summer months and a much longer night six months later. But it's definitely different from the cultural attitudes reflected by the phrase 9 to 5. Another example of sociocultural linguistics is the classic men are from Mars and women are from Venus thing, right? The male-female communication problem. It was linguist Deborah Tannen who offers some insight into the roots of male-female misunderstanding. And as a linguist who herself went through a divorce, Tannen, she applied her anthropological understanding of language to deconstruct what is it that can lead two people who love each other so much to quickly jump into heated arguments. She looked at the way boys and girls play in the United States, and she argued that our socialization during childhood it manifests itself in the way we communicate as adults. Boys in the U.S., according to Tannen, are raised to value larger group play, while girl play groups, they tend to be smaller and more intimate. And those smaller play groups can produce girls who've learned, much better than boys, how to build one-to-one -one ties with their friends. Ultimately, she says that males learn to embolden friendship by talking about all the cool stuff we do together, us guys. That and a few less personal conversations about the weather. Now, women, on the other hand, according to Tannen, develop a different culture of friendship. Specifically, they're much better attuned to the subterranean messages or meta-messages of even the most basic conversations. And it's not just things like body language or tone, it's the entire communicative experience 
An example a lot of us can relate to is when real estate agent Sam meets up with his wife, Ilana, uh, who's a high school principal. They've both had a tough and really long day, and so Sam, he gets on some comfy clothes and says to Ilana, hey honey, I'm gonna go for a bike ride. To which Ilana, a very, very nice person, replies, well, go ahead and go already. And already we've got the makings of an argument. See, Tannen proposes that Ilana Watching for levels of communication well beyond Sam's actual spoken words? Well, she basically heard Sam say, leave me alone, I want to go on a bike ride. Even though Sam thought he was saying, honey, I know we had a hard day, both of us, and I, I need to ride a bike. I'd love for you to come with me. Uh, that's why I'm mentioning it, but I don't want to make you feel like you have to come along. We can all relate to gendered communication breakdowns in our own families as sisters, brothers, spouses, parents, and, and more. But Tannen isn't saying that all women are small group-oriented people, nor is she saying that all men are idiots who can't express themselves in terms of their emotional and personal lives. She's simply using sociocultural linguistics to consider gender differences in the way men and women tend to communicate in the United States. Today, we've checked out primatology and linguistics to understand human language from anthropological perspectives. And when we consider our complex language as a unique feature of our humanity, it quickly reveals itself as one of the best things we developed to assure our sole place as the remaining hominins on this planet. And as we did with agriculture and tools, today we tried to pinpoint the origins of human language. But we found that the question is a bit more complex than we originally thought. Language. It's so much more than the words we write, say, or think. Darwin, he theorized that language, like biological organisms, it evolves from simple to dramatically more complex forms. Essentially, he said that human language emerged from animal communication. And you know what, that would explain, for example, how bees can give each other directions or how wolves manage to organize intricately sophisticated group hunting sessions. Like us, they communicate with each other especially when it comes to the basics of survival. Animals signal each other through body language, sounds, and smells. Now, that older-than-human compulsion to communicate, it's something we share with other animals. But our language is so complex, we can reasonably distinguish human language as something remarkably special in the animal kingdom we can point to biological distinctions of Homo sapiens as language users. We share a uniquely human mutation, for example, of the FOXP2 gene, and that dates to about 100,000 years ago in our evolution. Um, this gene actually has been directly linked to not only human language formation, but also spatial orientation. We also have intricately evolved bodies, our mouths, lungs, brains, and more, right? Uh, we can all orchestrate these in microseconds to produce just the right sequence of noise to easily communicate any idea that might come across our mind. And this unique ability, this distinctively human language, it may be our most critical game-changing adaptation yet. The basic hand signs and body language that we speculate were pre-verbal forms of human language, you know, think quiet hunters pointing and coordinating a kill, that communication style may have a lot in common with how bees or wolves may talk. But since that hypothetical earliest form of human language emerged, we've completely transformed the phenomenon of human language. And in so doing, we've irrevocably altered our minds, our bodies, and even our planet. And our big takeaway is this. This thing we developed called human language well, it not only helped us survive as the sole remaining hominin on Earth, but now we can see that it did nothing short of change the very nature of evolution itself. With language, unlike other animals, we humans, we collectively increased our capacity for information exchange. So instead of being governed by exchange and recombination of simply genetic information, with human language, we bring a new cultural force to evolution. By this, I mean that information exchange dramatically speeds up the development of new technology, and this technology extends our biologically evolved abilities. So, thanks to human language, 
We can now fly like the birds and dive into the depths like whales. We can heat our homes in the winter and even keep them cool in the summer. In short, human language has increased our ability to adapt. But of course, this, this adaptation through language and technology, it can have a dark side, as the very power we use to create can also be used to destroy. But perhaps by understanding the history, structure, and cultural aspects of communication, we'll collectively find a way to make language work for, rather than against, our continued survival.